Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this event. I am now apologizing to people who've heard my little welcome speech over 30 times. Um, I am Robin Schwartz. I'm the program and grant director for the Community Arts Partnership of Tompkins County. Uh, this is the 12th annual Spring Rights Literary Festival and it is just one of many programs that we have and grant programs and networking events and workshops. I think we have distributed over 4.6 million in grants to local artists and arts organizations since 1993 when I started that job. I've been there a long time. Our website, if you want to check it out, is artspartner.org. I'm going to write that into the chat. You can see what else we do. I have a co-host on the call, Leah Davis, and she's been helping me. And uh, if anyone needs help with any Zoom calls or even any other arts stuff, Leah is available. I want to thank our sponsors this year. We're so happy with our sponsors. Ithaca College, Wegmans, m and Bank, the Odyssey Bookstore on Green Street, and the Ithaca Marriott. We also have funds from the New York State Council on the Arts and Poets and Writers. Uh, so you know, because you went to springrights.org to sign up, that we have more events. We have an event after this, uh, Bob Prohl in conversation with Tom Dunn. And then next Thursday, Friday, no, next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have another, I think, nine events. Um, unlike previous years, we're doing one event at a time, and I like it better. So we had to spread it out over two weekends. We've also got eight workshops, free writing workshops from March, from December through March. So if you would love to be able to donate to the Community Arts Partnership, we need your money. <laughs> Every day when I say that speech, it gets less, you know, it gets more direct and less, uh, less flowery. I remember I was selling buttons in previous years and I'd do this whole little spiel and buy like, the last event, I was like, could you just buy a damn button? <laughs> <laughs> we would love it if you were able to donate to the Community Arts Partnership and, and everything we do really with our tiny staff of which I am 50% of. Um, a donation supports not only the festival, but really everything we do. So I'm gonna put a link about that up in the, in the chat. Please use the chat for asking questions and talking to each other and comments. Uh, you are all on mute. And uh, so chat, the chat function is the way that we can all talk to each other. And for the art, for the, for the panelists, uh, keep looking in the chat because if I have anything to uh, communicate with you, I will do it through chat. So without further ado, I am going to turn the program over to George. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for all your hard work and your miracle working in putting this wonderful festival together. And thank you for including us. Uh, welcome everyone to Succeeding in an Alternate Universe, Pros and Cons of Independent Presses and Self-Publishing. Thanks for coming out. I'm delighted to be on this panel with three of my very dear friends, whose work I have admired for many years. Uh, and so we're, we're each going to offer some comments about our experiences with publishing and then get into a little conversation and hopefully uh, we'll get lots of questions from everyone out there and we'll do our best to, um, to answer them. So uh, I'm going to begin by introducing the panelists uh, briefly, and then we'll, we'll each share our experiences. Starting with Alice Lichtenstein, whose new novel, The Crime of Being, from Upper Hand Press 2019, was nominated for a 2020 Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. And Alice has received many accolades. Her previous novels include The Genius of the World from Zolan Books 2000 and Lost, from Scribner 2010, which was a finalist for the International Impact Dublin Literary Award. Alice, did I say that correctly? Probably not. I, I'm impressed, I'm impressed. Okay, all right, Passable. I wouldn't take Latin, Roger, I mean, <laughs> George. <laughs> uh, Lichtenstein's short stories have been nominated for Pushcart Prize Awards, and Alice teaches fiction writing at Hartwick College in Oneonta, New York. Uh, we have next Jenna Howard's uh, work, uh, which includes three published novels, 
book two of her upstate novel trilogy from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt 2009 was a New York Times book review editor's choice. Chronogram called book three, Doing Time Outside from Standing Stone Books 2013, a beautiful read. Book one of the trilogy, Rope and Bone, a novel in stories from Illum 2014, was listed by Publishers Weekly as one of the best of the best indie books of 2015. Our poet on the panel, so we're multi-genre, we have fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, uh, so something for everyone. Our, our poet, Roger Hecht, has published three collections of poetry, a full-length book, Talking Pictures, and two chapbooks, Lunch at the Table of Opposites, and the recently released Witness Report. His poems have appeared in such journals as Denver Quarterly, Diagram, <coughs> Puerto del Sol, Gon Lawn. He is an associate professor in the English department at SUNY Oneonta, but makes his home in Ithaca. Now I get to speak about myself in the third person. Uh, George Hovis uh, has short fiction that has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and has recently published stories in the Carolina Quarterly, the Fourth River, New Madrid, and elsewhere. His debut novel, The Skin Artist, published by SFK Press in 2019, was nominated for the Sir Walter Raleigh Award and was a finalist for the Eric Hoffer Award. He is a professor of English at SUNY Oneonta, where he's been recognized with the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. So that is our panel. And um, I believe Alice is going to share first. Wow. Well, I too want to thank everyone involved in Spring Rice, and, and I want to thank uh, George for, for inviting me, and um, I too am a fan of the other panelists' work as well as everything about them. So, um, well, where to start in? So I think um, what I'm interested in talking about is my experience of publishing both very small and very large and very small again. And um, my first novel, The Genius of the World, was uh, published by Zolan Books. Um, there may be someone out there who knows that press. That was Roland Pease in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And he was an extraordinary guy who published mainly poetry, but also uh, literary fiction. And in fact, was Ha Jin, the wonderful writer, Ha Jin's uh, first publisher. So I um, was thrilled. I had worked, let's say, about 20 years on my first novel, and my agent had shopped it everywhere. And when I finally got the, the acceptance letter, I was ecstatic. And my agent was very, very grateful. She said, you're more in advance than some of my authors who get six figures. <laughs> You know, the funny thing was, I, I hadn't stopped to think about that. All I knew was I was being published by a wonderful small press. And um, I think that's actually the, the attitude that, that one should embrace. Um, the reality is it's very, very hard to publish literary fiction. And um, if someone, wants to publish your work who is not your mother, father, or, you know, significant other, uh, it's a deep, it's a deep honor. Um, the advance went to a really nice reading chair that I still have. And the, the attention and the introduction to being a published writer was really um, the, one of the gentlest and most compassionate ways a person could enter the publishing world. Um, at the time when I published it with the very small press, Solon, uh, was a time when uh, it was becoming very clear to the New York Times and other uh, newspaper, newspapers that had book reviews that the, um, the consolidation of the large commercial publishing houses was, was happening. They're particularly open to reviewing um, small and independent press books. And so, Zolan was greatly respected. Uh, 
God only knows how my book rose to the top of a, an enormous pile of, of submissions, but it did end up getting very nicely reviewed by the New York York Times, by National Public Radio, by you know other major papers. That was what what the real reward was, because of course one of the things you face as a published writer, you know, you think, oh, this is the best thing that could ever happen to me, and then you find out that that very best thing that ever happened to you happened to about you know eight thousand other novels in a three month period. So that you're really hoping um, it's very hard to get that word out unless your publisher is, is committed to helping you get that word out. Uh, stop me if I'm going on too long. You're great. So I will Thanks. cut to. So I was very fortunate with the very first independent small literary publisher exactly at the time that there were a number of places that still re reviewed books and they were interested in promoting small press books. My next novel was purchased by Scribner. And of course, then champagne corks flew and da di da. I actually was able to buy two reading chairs and a computer. <laughs> no. um, so there I was, you know, really excited, major commercial publisher, a uh, literary commercial publisher, and, you know, it's all just the roses. Except that you quickly learn that unless you are one of the six figure writers, though your editor is totally committed to your book and your agent has obviously been really committed to your book, your editor still has to face down something called the marketing department. Um, if I was a cartoonist, I would probably have, you know, a wonderful ability to, to create a vision of sort of some kind of monster sitting around a table tearing apart books that have already been accepted for publication and saying, no, we can't put money into this book. Um, anyway, one of the things they look at immediately is how much you've been paid for that book. And um, then the publicity people, they're they're a hard bunch to work, you know, to convince that they should be going all out for a book unless there's a lot of money. And this is just the real, the real deal. So your publisher encourages you to get on social media. You know, uh, TikTok wasn't around when I, when I published Law. So, I mean, probably they would have wanted me to do handstands going across Fifth Avenue, um, balancing uh, Lost, my second novel, you know, on my toes. And maybe I would have gotten another 10, 10 viewers, uh, to 10 readers, I don't know. But um, this is where I bring in, uh, and I'll try to make this brief, but this other aspect of publishing that is very difficult for some of us to wrap our minds around. There are writers out there who are gifted promoters. They're gifted self-promoters. And how you combine brilliant literary talent with brilliant marketing talent is something that has pure, you know, completely escaped me. There are people who can do it. And, you know, what can I say? They, that's a very fortunate trait to have in the present commercial publishing world. But if you're, you know, sort of an average shy retiring, occasionally tells a funny joke at a party kind of person, only after having had a few, then, it's a difficult, it's difficult to do both, to take on both roles. Some people hire publicists. Those are people who are not starving artists. <laughs> Others rely on the kindness of strangers, but mainly word of mouth through friends, relatives, classmates from kindergarten. I mean, you know, you, you, you work your, your network. But I'm just saying all this because the downside, you know, you think you've landed this wonderful, big, bustling commercial publisher, and there's actually a, it's, it's a real toss up. So book three, and, and then I'll cut, um, The Crime of Being. To my, you know, surprise, I will have to admit, I was all the way back to a very small independent press the upper hand press. 
again, you cannot match the enthusiasm of someone from a small press who put, you know, you, you're paid a pittance. Your publisher, you always have to remember in those small presses, is probably putting out $20,000 at least of their own money or whatever, however they raise money. So, you know, it, it, you, you, you have to be very humble about this. You're not in literary fiction for the money, presumably, anyway. Um, and in my case, uh, you know, just the, the, the pros in this case are an editor who and publisher who believes so much in this book that she nominated it for every you know, conceivable literary prize. She um, managed to get it nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in fiction, something Scribner would not have done because they have a whole a list way ahead of my book, presumably to have to promote. And, um, and then the negative side is there's no money for marketing or publicity. Like, None. You're not even fighting for a, a small slice of the pie. There's no pie. And, and so then you're back at that, that situation of marketing, essentially marketing your own book. And that's not fun. I'll be honest with you, that's not fun. The great deal of fun is writing. The, the difficult part of being a, a literary fiction writer is having to actually <laughs> market your book. And there, I rest my case. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Thank you. We'll hear more from Alice in a, in a bit. Um, I am going to share next uh, my journey to publishing my novel, The Skin Artist, last year with an independent press located in Atlanta called Southern Fried Karma, or SFK Press. Um, and my novel, I had an agent a few years, a few years ago, more than a few years ago for this book. Uh, and she shopped it around to two dozen New York houses. It didn't sell. sell. Um, I found another agent for the manuscript until I informed her that, well, I had had an agent who wasn't able to sell it and she quickly withdrew her interest and explained Honey, once uh, a manuscript has had its debut, uh, it, it, it's done. So when you write another novel, send it to me. Um, so I, I got busy writing another novel and then another novel. Uh, and al along the way, uh, a friend of mine had started working as an editor for this new press in Atlanta, SFK. And she had read one of the recent manuscripts and had solicited it. At the time, that manuscript was out with an agent and I sort of didn't want to disrupt that process. So uh, I got to thinking about this old manuscript that had been in the drawer for some years. And I pulled it out again and read it for the first time in, in a number of years. And it quickly dawned on me why the agent was unable to sell the book. It was it was bad. <laughs> it was, <laughs> or a, a gentler way to say that is, it wasn't ready. <laughs> but uh, despite it's not being ready, I thought, or despite it's being bad, I thought there's promise here. You know, I still had affection for those characters and got busy working on it, and then sent it to my friend at this press. They uh, gave me a contract and then I got cold feet, to be honest. I had this contract. It was a press I you know, didn't know much about or, or hardly anything about, except that my friend was working there uh, and that they were going to, to pay me something to publish my novel. And in this contract, they were <laughs> going to gain all the rights to my novel and I, I'm someone who is made nervous by legal contracts. And so I, I took it to Alice Lichtenstein, all in a tizzy. Alice remembers this. We had coffee and, oh, okay. and I was, you know, Alice, should I, should I do this or? And Alice told me, look, 
you know, you are lucky <laughs> to have a publisher who wants to publish your work. This is a wonderful thing. Um, and, I, and I'll say also that in the meantime, I, I got around to reading a few of the novels that this publisher had put out. And I thought, you know, these are good novels. Um, not only are, are they wonderful stories, but the presentation is strong. You know, the design, the interior and the cover design, they, they make a good product. So I thought I'll, I'll be delighted to have my book come out with this press. And, um, and then I came to find out that they had hired as uh, their developmental editor, Pinkney Benedict, who's a short story writer whom I had admired for many, many years. And I thought, well, gee, I've got the opportunity to work with Pinkney. Um, you know, even though I didn't get to publish this book with some, you know, great New York house or whatever, I'm, go I'm gonna see what this independent press from Atlanta can, can do. And um, to make the long story short, I'll just say I've been delighted with, you know, publishing The Skin Artist with this independent press. Um, they, they produced a book that I'm proud of. And I will say that when, when I sent it to them, it was a lot better than when I pulled it out of the drawer. <laughs> but, <laughs> It had a, still a long way to go. And uh, Pinckney, as the developmental editor, gave me the kind of developmental edit that I think every writer just dreams of having, where it was smart, it was thorough, but it was not sort of bending my arm behind my back and saying, if you don't do this, we're not going to publish it. So I... I felt that I still retained um, control of the work, but I gained wonderful insight. And then the stylistic editor and the other rounds of editing that happened to it, the interior, the exterior, all the work that, as Alice was saying, goes into your, your book from an independent press is, um, I just felt like it was a tremendous gift to me. So, it's, so for me, uh, publishing the scan artist with this independent press has been a wonderful experience and um, I'll stop there and pass on. Well, why don't you, do you have your cover, your book there? Because it has a great cover. Oh, George? No. you know what? Um, <laughs> I don't have one handy either, but it just, I mean, I'm going to pass it on to you and then I'll go to the other room here in a bit okay. and grab one. <laughs> I have a copy okay. down for a one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I will show my cover shortly. Thank you. And show your cover, Jenna, because your cover is an Alice. Everyone should show your cover. Uh, yeah, yours is I'll even, do that even, when I even better. Understand. You yeah. you produced your cover. You might tell us about that, right, Jenna? I will. Yeah. So I'll turn it over to you, Jenna, and then. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about self-publishing or as it's called in the industry, it's, it's not called self-publishing. It's called indie, indie publishing, because, and now it's, it's an awful lot of people are doing self-publishing. So I think it isn't, doesn't ring so much a vanity press, but when it first started, it did. So it needed indie to do that. And so what happened for me was I started writing very late in my mid forties. I was an English teacher. I never thought of writing. And then just some things fell into place. Mostly I met a very amazing, uh, this is a stereotype, but a, a very amazing motorcycle couple who would go by <laughs> my place. I was renting a log cabin out in the woods and they just fascinated me and sort of got me starting to learn to write because I really needed to learn to write. I did not have any uh, anything going for me other than I'd always loved to read. Um, but what happened was I started writing short stories that involved two different families in upstate New York and about 15 uh, copies, about 15 of those stories got published. Uh, and the, one, the first one I sent out got published in North American Review. So it was, you know, just one of those things of going to conferences and going to workshops and really learning to write. And my main time I crossed over was learning to show rather than tell. 
that was my, you know, that was what I had to learn. And a lot of writers know that right away, but I did not know that. But anyway, what happened was uh, I actually got an, a New York agent who was very interested in the book, but she could not sell it. She gave it her all. Um, but she couldn't sell it. And so, and I'd done all the queries and all that. So I simply put it aside. And at that point I had started another book, which it turned out happened to be the same characters. I didn't really have that in mind, but it was sort of, there were like two families and it was sort of the other family. Uh, and so I wrote that. I was working in a great workshop at West Courtright with Murmur Blakesley and getting critiquing uh, on that. And by that time I really had made a lot of progress. Um, so it was called Night Navigation and it took place about 10 years after the book that she couldn't sell, which I'm gonna talk about in the self-publishing. Um, and it sold in a couple of days, really. It, it two, two days, that was it. They gave me a big advance, uh, a New York Times book review. Uh, and and all of that and so that was really that was really fun and plus it was more money than I ever ha would have and would ever have again um, and so then uh, what happened was I really got going on a third book which turned out to be so now I, I'm working on a trilogy really but book one didn't get published but it, it was the beginning of it all and uh, and again my agent wasn't able she wasn't too enthused about that she wasn't able to sell it and a wonderful writer Charlotte Walker who you all know kept saying to me the ending of the book it's called doing time outside and it's about the motorcycle family has a member of the family in jail and that's what then they're doing time outside and so she Charlotte kept saying to me it's the wrong ending it's the wrong ending and I kept saying yeah, but that's the, what happens. <laughs> but finally I changed it and it really was a miracle that it didn't get accepted anywhere because it's so much better book uh, for, for the changes. But anyway, again, my agent couldn't sell it. She wasn't too enthused about it. And so it went for a small press, which was Standing Stone Books in Syracuse. And some of you may know that it, I don't think he's working on that anymore. But, um, but what happened was at that point then, I knew that Rope and Bone, which was book one, was a good book. All those stories had been published. I had gotten an agent. And so that's when I decided to do self-publishing. And, uh, and I had a unique situation, which was ideal in many ways, which was a couple of people in my town had formed an artist writers co-op. And they would do all the work that it took to get it self-published and create space, which was a, an Amazon company. It's now called Kendall Direct. Uh, and so they would do the copy edit. The, the woman who was in charge of that would do the copy editing. And, uh, and then the other woman who was an artist would set it up in InDesign because it's what you have to do when you're gonna turn it into a self-publishing situation. You turn in the MS word gets turned into InDesign and somebody has to do that. And also she was a collage specialist. So she was able to take a drawing that I had always wanted to be the cover on my book which was a, a, a drawing of my husband's shoes and my sandals. And the book is very much about how women wear sandals and women and men wear boots. That's a stereotype, but that's really what it was about. And, uh, and I so wanted that, but I had drawn it on a piece of brown paper with pencil. And so she was, and then I went to the, went to Office Max and got a beautiful piece of, of sort of yellowish paper. And she, being a collage artist, could lift those shoes off of that brown paper with the brown background still there, put it down on this piece of yellow paper. And it just was, it was, it was one of the high points of everything that it was going to be self-published because I love the cover. And I am going to hold it up. I don't know if I'm in a position where you can really... Can you see? You can only see part of it. <laughs> I don't have enough position here. But anyway, it's a beautiful cover. It really is. It's, it's one of the best covers I've ever seen. Uh, and so what happened was then we sent it off to, uh, you know, we sent it off to Create Space, which is now Kendall Direct, and they did the rest. And at that point, you know how you already have a Amazon page uh, all set up. You've got your cover, you, you know, you've got everything well on its way. And what happens when you send in the, um, the, the, in the InDesign to 
uh, create space is in 24 hours, they send you back the manuscript. And if any, they send you back the InDesign, now it's in format for them. And if it has anything wrong with it, uh, and it's always your fault. It, it never, they never do anything wrong. Basically, they send it back and you see that it needs something fixed. It might just be that, you know, you did a simple thing like sent, not center something that needed to be centered. So you go through and you do that. You send it in again. 24 hours later, you get it back. If there's anything wrong, you fix it. And you can do that. I think we did that six times in order to finally get, there were just small things here and there. And again, they were all things that we were doing wrong. But the amazing thing is finally when you decide that this is it uh you there's a little icon there that says something like uh done or publish or something like that you just touch it and it says your book is now available on amazon and it is it's still in create space space for about two days but it's in completely available to order then and it's completely on the regular amazon pages to order so that was a lot of fun um to do that and and, and so you will not necessarily have a, a little artist co-op in your town that can do that technical part, or you may very well be able to do InDesign work. I just don't do anything like that. I'm lucky I can even get the Zoom, Zoom thing going. So, uh, so that was great. But the, but the biggest thing I wanna say to you is the, the toughest thing about self-publishing is you have to market the book. And in order to market the book, you have to get reviews because it's reviews that lift you out of the self-publishing self world. I mean, that's what the big press, that's what the Houghton Mifflin Harcourt did for me, which was the New York Times plus a whole bunch of other uh, you know, publications plus sending out hundreds of books uh, you know, and all of that, but they didn't do that much marketing. So what I knew how to do at that point from already from uh, publishing, having two books published is I already knew a lot about marketing, which was to be uh, you know, a writer at colleges, to go to lots of book, book clubs, to go to lots of libraries, to go to a lot of bookstores and all of that. And I loved the book, Rope and Bone. So you know, I loved reading from it. It was, it was a, one of those books that was good to read out loud. Um, and so that's what you, if you decide you wanna self-publish, and by the way, I think my, you could go to my website if you, if I, you have any questions about self-publishing or you want me to send you any kind of attachment I'd be happy to do that. And it's just ghoward.com. Um, but anyway, uh, that that was such a that was such an up. Uh, but the big thing that I did and the advice that I give to you, because there are all sorts of companies now that will put this book together for you. And one of them is is it's called, and I'm just going to say this simply because it was recommended to be by somebody who I really trust. Uh, about uh, people who can do the technical side for you. And that is, it's called, um, I've got it here on a piece of paper in front of me, if I can find it. Um, the, the guy's name is Nick C-A-Y-A, -A, and, uh, and he can do a paperback for you for, I'm trying to find it. He can do a paperback for you and that will go, you know, and a, and a Kindle. Uh, you know, at a, at a decent price and in pretty speedy and very well. And so if you uh, are wanting to find somebody to do the technical stuff, you'll be able to find it because there are plenty of those people around now that do that. And if you don't want to use Amazon, you can use the other companies like Book Baby or iUniverse. There are many good book companies too. The only thing I will say, and this is the, the truth about this, and that is that you may not you know, you may want to avoid Amazon because of what Amazon is, and especially now. But the thing about it is, is that Amazon robots are much more friendly to your book if you produce it in Amazon. They really are, because if you use an outside di distributor, when you first get your book ordered on Amazon, they will send you, the robots will send you a note that says, it'll be available in two weeks because they don't keep any books in house. Once you've sold quite a few, then they do keep, 
keep books in house. And so it's not so much of an issue, but it's something to think about, uh, you know, if, if, especially in the marketing. On the other hand, if you really believe in uh, doing the right thing in the world, you, you might go to uh, Book Baby or something like that. But the biggest advice I want to offer to you, and that is, and then I, I, my time will be up, but that is, it's very important that you send two copies of your book to booklife.com. Because what happens there, and that's something that George mentioned when he talked about my books, what, what Book Life does for you is it gets you a review if you're, if you're fortunate enough to get a review. And that is Book Life is connected to Publishers Weekly. And what Book Life wants to do is sell you, a, it's free to get this review and to send, you send your two books in and it tells you exactly how to do that. Uh, and that doesn't cost anything, it really is free. So you don't have to pay for a review or anything like that and you never would wanna pay for a review. Um, but what it does for you is, it, uh, is, it, it, is that if you get a review, the review goes in Publishers Weekly and, it, and Publishers Weekly goes to all libraries in the country and all bookstores once a month and it has to be an indie book in order to be part of book life because that's what it's about. And if it gets a starred review, which mine did, and it was the best review ever written about how the world I hope I made. In other words, who, the person who wrote the review got the book much better than the New York Times person. I mean, I was very happy to get the New York Times for night navigation, but the person didn't really understand the world of the book, which was the way it is. But anyway, the review was great. And it was also for the ebook because it had there was a, a Kindle version. And so if you get a starred review, then you get a big space on the indie page. It's like your book cover, it's the review, you know, all of that. And it takes up, you know, probably a third of the page and the other small reviews are on their side. And then if, um, if then, then what they do is they take the 12 stars that were given the whole year, the 12 months, there's only one starred review a month. And they call that, and that's what George read, then they call that one of the best. You're one of the best of the indies and they do another whole promotion. And all this of course is just to make money, but it's a big deal. I mean, cause you get to say when you send out all your marketing stuff, cause you got to put all these things on flyers and, and so you get to say, and this book was one of the best of the best. And, you know, and this happened to be, I think was 2000. I don't, I've forgotten the year now, but anyway, of that year, but the last thing I want to say to you is now they have come up with a new thing and, I, and it's, this is all just in the works and I'm going to try to explain it to you. But just recently I got an email uh, from a company that has gotten together with uh, Biblio Labs. This is Book Life and Biblio Labs have gotten together. And what they're going to do is they're going to have Book Life Elite. And so they're going to take those 60 stars uh, over the five years, and all of those are ebooks, and you fill out a very simple form, and they're going to send it out to market those to all the libraries in the country, hoping that they will then want to buy some kind of use of the ebooks for their readers to take out. Uh, and you will then get actually get royalties. Now this is all just happening, but I think it is going to happen because they've already sent where should we deposit the check. Um, so you know it hasn't gotten that far by any means. But the great part about that for me is that not only will Rope and Bone you know be part of that, but since it's a trilogy, if people like Rope and Bone on the ebook that they can get from their library then it may put some energy back into night navigation and doing time outside. And I love all three books. So of course, it, you know, again, it's not about the money, but it would be fun to have readers again, because after a while, you know, that just isn't happening as much. Um, I mean, I do still get, I do still sell books on, on Amazon. So some, of, some people are still reading it. But anyway, basically that's what I have to say. But my biggest piece of advice is do send the two books. If you decide to self-publish uh, the two paperbacks that you'll have you know, to book life and it may go your way because it was a great experience. Okay, thanks. I guess that means I'm up now. Um, so um, <clears throat> poetry is a, 
is, is, a, is a somewhat different world because nobody expects to make any money on it. <laughs> uh, and there's certainly no film rights that are gonna come out of a poem, or if there is, it's incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, so my experience with publishing poetry books is, uh, it sort of runs the gamut in a way. My first book, uh, I do have it with me, Lunch at the Table of Opposites, was um, uh, uh, how, how that happened is I, I had a, a friend in graduate school who was regularly publishing books and he recommended this press as, uh, as a possibility. I've been sending out a lot, a lot of initial first books, uh, poetry books are often uh, done through contests.